All right, so we're back with Ken and Mike on My Uncle's Escaped Alcatraz. And today we have a listener questions that we're going to be answering. So we got a bunch of questions from our listeners. Thank you for responding so quickly. Mike was uh, great enough to uh, put all these together. And uh, if I'm, I'm, we're just going to say your first name so we know we, we're not going to say your last name. Uh, as far as that. So, but before we get into that, guys, um, what's new? Have you heard anything new? Do you get any kind of when you s- saw these questions and the feedback? How does that make you feel that people are really kind of intrigued with this story or fascinated? Well, one of the things for me that I was pleasantly surprised was a number of the people who wrote us are from other countries. Uh, one from the Netherlands, one from Norway, and uh, one from Australia. Wow. So we're, we're getting, and those are the ones that ask questions. You know, obviously there are many, many more people out there. I mean, our, our, our Facebook site has 6,000 followers. So um, obviously it, this is international. So there's a strong interest in the story, not just here in the U.S. People know about it. They want to they wanna learn more. And, and they're very enthusiastic in their responses of how much they love the show. They love the podcast. Um, they listen to it every week. They, they learn uh, all kinds of interesting things. And just as we are, you know, we're all learning new things. And uh, we talked off air. I won't go into details, but new things are happening. So it's the story that is building, building. And uh, we're really excited where it's taking us. Yeah, yeah I, I'll agree uh, with Mike. I, I'm, I've always been intrigued by how many people outside the country is interested in the story. I have one individual who he emails me religiously every Thursday morning. Uh, is there a podcast coming out today? <laughs> I can't wait for it. And uh, he always responds with how, how much he loves it. He shares it with other people. It's kind of become, you know, like a, a tradition now. Every Thursday, people are looking for this podcast. Um, and, and two, I think every one of the questions are coming from people that have actually read the book. Uh, rather than sometimes you got people that just kind of follow it, but don't don't really have invested the, the time and to read the book. And so now they're, this book is is having questions come up in people's minds. So it's, it's kind of exciting to, to answer these questions. And I saw from your Facebook group that people are finding the books in bookstores and, and finding yes. them on the shelves, which is great. Right. Well, in libraries, too. Now, believe it or not, I had a friend here in Panama City that uh, – went to the local library and our book is in the library. So, you know, people now can check it out and read it. So very, very interesting. That's yeah, fantastic. Man. And also I want to acknowledge that my wife Cindy's here for the first time in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Sorry, I've been gone. <laughs> I've been working on location, filming a show and I'll, yeah, we that that ask questions like, where are you? How can I know, I know. I, know. Asking, I should have said something before. We can't talk about it. The authority said we can't speak of this. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a little crazy filming and trying mm-hmm. to do this at the same time. So I had Don't to take a little break. Put your um, yeah. But I'm back. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully we're going to have some really good announcements for you guys soon relating to this story in the book and what we're trying to do to get the message out there and also – to find answers to what happened to John Clarence and Frank Morris and whether or not they did make it, you know, I mean, I think we make a really good case here as well as Ken and Mike's book makes a fantastic case that, you know, they did make it and they did live out their lives uh, in, in South America, but, you know, our next, you know, chore and quest, if you will, is to make sure we can kind of, prove that definitively and we're we're putting people in place that that can help us do that and like i said more announcements to come with that and i'm putting together a pretty high profile team so we'll be sharing that with you hopefully soon as soon as all that comes together but let's get to some of these questions now some of them we're going to be kind of cagey with because we don't want to reveal too much information because we don't number one we, we can't confirm it yet and we have strong suspicions and others that, you know, we just, uh, we're, we're kind of uh, holding back until we got all our ducks aligned in the row. But this one comes from Justine. And, um, it, and her question is, or Justin, I guess it's Justin, Justin, not Justine. And sorry, I can't read it. Start over. Start over. <laughs> so this is from Justin. Is Clarence the one on the deed of the farm? 
the son of Clarence. Since it said Clarence to Clarence, so maybe Clarence signed the property over to his son before he passed away. And that's a really good question that we don't know the answer definitively yet, too. Right. But we're gonna we're working on finding that one out. And as I alluded to just before that we put together a team that's an investigative team that is going to help us find all that stuff. To try to get paperwork down there is we have to work with uh, you know the local authorities there, and it's it's been a bit of a red tape there. But you know I think we we're we're in a really good position to answer that question. But what what do you guys think about that? What do you do in general? What do you think? Well, I, you know I would say I mean I could I could definitely see that happening. Uh, according to Fred. You know, both of the brothers owned the farm. He he never said Frank Morris was part owners of the farm. He did say John and Clarence was. And I mean, I could see them wanting to keep this in the family. So at some point in time, yeah, I could I could definitely see him signing the property over to his son. Um, I don't know how many children he he might have had in the end. I do know, you know. When Fred told us about it in '92, uh, and it, so that would have been back in '75, I believe he had three at that time. So, yeah, I mean, I could definitely see him turning this this property over. And what's exciting too is that the possibility that it's still in their name today, if he did. So it won't. It wouldn't be like I always kind of feared that maybe. John and Clarence at some point in time would have sold the farm, took the money and probably moved. But it does sound like that maybe it's still in the family's name. So it should really kind of help us when we really start digging down there. It also seems like your family was very tight knit. I can't imagine that would have ever changed with John and Clarence. No, they were, uh, they, they would have been, well, just like my mom, you know, my mom, and dad have kept the property they've had now for over 60 years. And, you know, they don't ever want to see it gone. They want it, you know, given to the, the three children. So I can, I mean, that, that value system that John and Clarence had was the same value system that their parents gave them and instilled in them. So yeah, that family oriented, if, if at all possible, they would have kept it in the family and as large as it was. Now they might've sold some of it. You know, maybe at some point in time, they got to the point that it didn't need it as large as, as, as Breezy described it. So uh, whether or not they sold some, I I'm not sure, but I am I am happy to, to really think about the possibility that it's still kept in the family's name. Well, to me, it comes down to the name Clarence. Right. Yeah. I was going to bring that up. Um, you know, the with the people that we're looking at and just the searches we're making, you know, the name Clarence has popped up within a family and people. And even in the United States, Clarence is not a common name. No. Uh, and, you know, it's more of an, it's an older name. Last you know, time I heard about it was on the Andy Griffin show. You know, it's like you see right. someone named Clarence or something like that. Right. It's right. like in I Live Lucy, you know, Ethel was a character. With exactly. No not Ethel anymore. It's an old name. And Clarence is one of those names. And to have people that were finding down there, Clarence within the family, is highly unusual because in in Brazil it's it's a Portuguese culture, and Clarence is not a Portuguese name. So why would family members name children Clarence? It's 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 not even a in remotely Latin name at all. No, right. So so that's very promising to have a, a family member with that name or fam members, I should say. Um, with that name, that that is a very strong lead, and um, anyway, we'll, we'll we'll see where where it turns up. But uh, it's 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 very hopeful that the that's going to get us where we need to go. Because as as people have said, you know, or have you said, we've made a very compelling case. We have a lot of areas of proof that we've looked at, but we don't have that nail in the coffin. We don't have that. This is absolutely irrefutable evidence of who they are. And that's what everyone's wanting from us. And that's what we want for ourselves. We all right. want that. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to do it. I think we're going to, I think the team we're putting together is going to help and we're going to find out 
these all these um, these answers to these questions. All right, so the next one up is uh, from Steve, and he wants to know what happened to Frank Morris. And we've talked a little bit, like speculated a little bit about what we felt like what happened to Frank. We felt like he he probably did go down to Brazil with them, didn't stay down there because um, number one, he you know he he you know, the brothers were farmers. They could figure out a way to make a living down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think who was it that, um, I think Stuart Fillmore, the FBI agent was talking about the fact that, you know, Frank was, he was a real, he was a real felon, even though your brothers were felons too, but he was a, he was a violent felon. And so, and he only made his way through doing stuff like this. These guys actually, Clarence and John actually had a skill that they could actually use in order to survive down there. So I think we speculated that, you know, he probably could have went back up to Mexico because he spoke Spanish and maybe he could have blended in there more well and, and that he can kind of find a space for himself. And uh, probably it was a good idea for them to all separate to begin with. You don't want to be clustered together. You know, the brothers are the brothers. They're, they're used to evading law enforcement and been doing this ever since they were children. <laughs> but, you know, with Frank, you know, I think it probably was, you know, he, he probably wanted to make his own way. So what do you guys think? Well, you know, I would say this. So I thought a lot about Frank when we were writing this book, uh, especially around some of the evidence that was discovered in the uh, Bay, case in points to the letters that belonged to John Clarence. And I, you know, it kind of hit me then is like, why wasn't any letters found that was uh, written to Frank Morris? And then I started thinking, of, you know, Frank Morris was a loner. He, he had no family, which is kind of sad. He had no one writing him. He had no one that would actually be able to tell his stories later. So maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't know a lot about Frank Morris is because there's no family members like John Clarence had that uh, kept in touch with him. But we do have three, I would say, three sightings or three pieces around Frank Morris. The first one is Whitey Bolger. You know, Whitey came out and he pretty much said in the letter that all three of them made it, not just John and Clarence, John, Clarence, and Frank Morris. Uh, and then you have the resident down in Brazil that Mike and I spoke to in 2002, uh, 2022. He said there were three Americans there, three American men. That's not two. So there again, now you have another possible sighting of Frank Morris. And then, of course, you have Fred Breezy. Fred Breezy, when he's telling the family in 1992 about his visit, you know, he, one of the members of the Anglin family, one of my aunts, I can't remember who it was, I could go back and listen, asked him about the third man. And he said, well, there was, and this, I'm kind of quoting about what how he said it. He yeah. said, there was a third American with them. I was never introduced to him, but there was a third American man there, and he was with a blonde-headed woman. So you have three possible sightings of Frank Morris. So now, whatever happened to him after 1975, if he stayed there, you know, Whitey kind of indicated one time in a letter that, you know, uh, uh, Brazil was Portuguese and Frank Morris spoke Spanish, which he said multiple times to me that. Same quote made me kind of think he was trying to tell me he went back into Mexico and possibly out of the country. So, you know, I personally believe Frank Morris made it along with John and Clarence. Uh, he went down there. Whatever happened to him after that, um, I think it's speculation. Yeah. Well, that picture that you you sent me was uh, really interesting, too. The picture that we uh, of someone that looks, you know, a younger version that could possibly be, uh, you know, a son. Oh my God. Now a, a, a story around that photo. I probably hadn't told you this, uh, but I took that photo one time and I said, uh, I, I said, I was talking to art um, in a text and I said, art, have you, have you seen uh, all the photos of Frank Morris? And he was, yeah, pretty sure. And so I said, have you ever seen this photo of Frank Morris? And I sent him the photo. And he came back and said, wow, no, I haven't seen that photo of Frank Morris before. He actually thought it was Frank Morris. <laughs> the one that looked close. This person does. looks like Frank Morris. 
it yeah. fueled even art into thinking that that was Frank. Is there any possibility that Frank went to Canada? Is there any, did you guys find anything in your research about that? No, no, there the two things. Well, I have three points about Frank Morris, because yeah, we, we haven't talked a lot about him on the show. Obviously we're focusing on the brothers. Um, but you know, I thought, because when we set up the query, like, Hey everybody, you know, here's your chance to ask questions that you want to have answered. And we had several about Frank Morris, because we haven't talked a lot about him. Uh, one of the things that, um, when they were doing the 2015 documentary that Ken was on, um, the agent, um, the one uh, after art or Michael Dykes, uh, he was desperately wanting the DNA uh, from Ken's family because they had found the bones uh, nine months after the escape on, on the beach, um, some 20 miles away. And they didn't know whose they were, so they buried them. And then, you know, when DNA becomes a, a possible research tool for identifying people, they reinterned the bones or not reinterned. They uh, got the bones out and they did DNA tests on them. And they wanted the family members, both the Morris family and the Anglin family to submit their DNA to see if they were one of the, you know, one of the escapees that had died and the bones washed up on the beach. And he had said to Ken that they had found some distant family member of the Morris family, like a, like a third cousin or something. And they were able to get his DNA. And so they wanted the DNA from Ken's family. And he tried all kinds of means to get at it. And the family refused. It, it wasn't until they did the documentary that they finally submitted it in exchange for, um, uh, you know, examining Alfred to see if he had been tortured to death. Exactly. <laughs> so there, there is somebody out there, but very, very distant, you know, just, just enough to make a connection. But and evidently that's all he was able to find was just this one person. Cause Morris had said, uh, you know, prior to the escape that his mother had died and that's really the only family they'd ever really talked about was his mother. And even then he didn't have a very good relationship with her, uh, growing up and he was in foster homes for most of his young life before he started becoming, you know, resorting to criminal activities. So, um, you know, who that person is, we don't know. They're probably not alive anymore, most likely. So for the- well, I, I'm sorry if, if I missed this, but um, so were they able to extract some DNA from that person? Yes, they yeah. were. Yeah, because when, when in the documentary at the end of the uh, show, when Art comes to the family, primarily to Ken's mother, and they give the results of the DNA, it was a, it was a negative match, you know, that right. it, it wasn't connected to the Morris family. Or, I'm sorry, the Anglin family. Well, they already knew it wasn't the Morris family. They already knew right. that. And so then it was, we don't know who this person is now because yeah. it's not connected to the escapees at all. A, it was just a body that, you know, somebody drowned and, or it could have been an accident or whatever. And, and yeah. his bones washed up on the, on the shore. Yeah. But it was right. only, it was only one body. So it's right. Like, well, well, actually it wasn't even a whole body. It's like a femur. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I think it was like maybe three or four pieces of the bone that, that washed up. And at the time, like as Mike said, they, they had no way of identifying who it was. DNA that existed at that time. So they buried it in a potter's grave and they made a notation of it. And Michael Dykes uh, was going through the FBI files when he got the case. And he happened to notice this and he said, hmm, I wonder if there's any you know connection to this. So he went and had him exhumed. And from there, he tried to test the DNA and didn't get a hit with the Morris family. So then he came after the Anglin family. And eventually we allowed him, once he we had Alfred exhumed, they took the DNA out of one of the femur bones of Alfred. So now you have brother to brother match rather than sister to brother. And it definitely came back uh, negative. So. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two other things about Morris was uh, when we were doing research for the book, we came across a document um, that the inmates, what they used to be able to do well at Alcatraz was um, they could request uh, either books from the library, books and magazines. They, they couldn't go to the library directly. Uh, if, if you We've talked about the uh, Clint Eastwood movie, and they do accurately portray the library that you had people working there, and then they would go to the cells and, and give them the things that they've requested. It's not like a library today where we can go in and, oh, I'll take this book with me. Uh, they had to request it on paper or they can buy magazines and books or things of their own. They each inmate had its their own little bank account, their own savings account yeah. that um, they could put money into or they worked and they would deposit money on their behalf. And then they can use that money to buy things. 
And we have a, a document from Frank Morris where he's ordering books or excuse me, magazines primarily, um, you know, to read in a cell. And also one of them is a Spanish book. So and this I was several Spanish. weeks before yeah. the escape. So he was brushing up on his Spanish uh, before going to, uh, you know, for the escape, because, you know, uh, Breezy said that they went to Mexico. And we would believe that they were there for a couple of years and then, you know, later made their way down to South America. But they were in Mexico for, for a while. And Morris, you know, spoke Spanish. And also when uh, Alfred died, uh, the FBI interviewed his cellmate when he was at uh, Atlanta, as I recall. Wow. Yeah, Atlanta. And one of the things the cellmate said that he believed that the three were in Mexico, also in Mexico. And he specifically noted that because Morris could speak Spanish and he knew people there, they had spent a lot of time in Mexico, you know, prior to uh, his time at Alcatraz. And that would be a, a place for him to hide because he can blend in and he knew the culture, he knew the language. So we have numerous sources telling us the same thing that uh, Morris would be definitely drawn to Mexico. So they were probably there for a time, go down to uh, South America. And then at least until 75 or so, um, he's still with the family. He's still with the brothers. And then at some point leaves and probably goes back to Mexico. And we don't know what happened. That's where the trail goes cold. He just kind of disappears and nothing's ever heard from him again that we know of. Was, was, I can't remember. Was Frank older than the, the brothers? Yeah. yeah, he was about five years old. He was born in 26. Yeah. And uh, Frank, would, Frank would be pushing 99, actually, maybe next year. Yeah, he'll be so he's, he's 90, his, his 98 case, today. Yeah, his, his part of the case could actually be closed, uh, according to the U.S. Marshals. You know, they don't yeah. actually close them, they just quit looking. For them. Yeah, no. I think they I quit can't even them. imagine they're looking for John Clarence either. No, 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 no. I don't think they are either. They got enough on their hands right now. I totally agree. Um, all right, cool. The other one is the, the follow-up question from Steve is, uh, do you believe both brothers are dead? Ooh, you know, I've, I've thought about a lot about this one too. Um, I was really, I was really shocked when we went to Brazil, Mike and I, there was a there was a, a a man that they had hired to help us to uh, carry gear up onto the mountain that we were going up to to investigate the items that we found, and I was shocked that this guy. I mean, I got pictures of it. I was shocked that this guy was ninety five years old. I mean, you look at him and he looked like he was in his seventies. So I do know that the lifestyle down in Brazil is a lot different than here. Now, if they were living in the U.S. with all the you know, all the processed foods that we eat and uh, unhealthy lifestyle, I would say, yeah, they would definitely be dead. But living down there, I, now I've got a different perspective. Uh, they could have changed their lifestyle, and it's possible that one of them's alive. Uh, my grandfather lived to be 92. John would be pushing 94, 95. So, I mean, it's possible. Um, I, I'm not going to rule anything out. Uh, uh, until we get down there. I mean, Although, it's very possible when we go down that we find him <laughs> so still alive. Yeah, I, I would say most if if either of them are alive, it's probably going to be John because so good. because Clarence was a was a chronic smoker, and right. we've talked about the the photograph of the two brothers in Brazil. Mm -hmm. and we've talked about the cigarettes in Clarence's pocket shirt right. pocket that you can see the outline of the the box in his there. And so he was in the mid seventies, he was still smoking, obviously. Mm -hmm. So he was, he probably never stopped. That would be my guess. Since he'd been smoking since he was probably in his teens, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. um, so just, I think just the years of the cigarette smoke would just, you know, would be the end of him at, at some point. But John, you know, I can see John still being alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, hey, again, my grandfather smoked all his life. All the way up until the day that he died. Some people doesn't affect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it never impacted him one bit. No, and that's the thing too. Like my aunt, my gr my grandmother's sister lives in Italy, and she's ninety one, and you would never know it. Their lifestyle is so right. different in these other countries, and she can farm and she can do all these things. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother in America passed away at like sixty five. That's that's what I'm telling you. You know, if, if I would, if someone asked me where they're alive today and they were living in the U.S., 
I would probably think no. But after seeing that individual in Brazil and how healthy he was, and he was like 90, and I actually believe I saw a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that the lifestyle, you have to really kind of throw out this U.S. lifestyle. Yeah. If I mean, what's the, to them down there? Yeah. What's the altitude like in that area? Yeah, it was very high. So that's was, another thing. I mean, her, her, her aunt lives in like at the base of the Dolomites right. in Northern Italy. And I, I think, and they do, they have studies on people who live in high altitudes. They, they live a long time. Right. And I mean, the food that they ate was so much different than what ours was. So I'm just saying, you know, if, if, well, you know, one of the things I guess we could probably look at, if you took an age, I think I took the, uh, one of the photos of John when he was in Alcatraz, his last photo, and I age progress, progression that uh, even though it looked like the guy in the 1975 photo, the guy in the 1975 photos actually looked more healthy than the age progression photo that you would have done from someone living in the U.S. So yeah. maybe the lifestyle had already started, you know, taking an impact on that. Well, it sounds like you guys have good genes anyway. You said, you know, your grandfather lived till he was 92. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I mean, you're, I mean, how old are you, Ken? I am 64. You're 64. Yeah. I mean, you're still competing. You competed in yes. Ironman. Iron you know, Man, I do Iron Man, I scuba dive, I run races. So. It's yeah, very few sixty-four-year-olds are doing what you're doing. So obviously, it's your you know your genetics have, have served you well and served your family. Well, your mom's still alive. My mom's uh, still alive. You know, her sister is still alive. Who is a pain smoker? <laughs> so See? I mean, Maybe if your anyone, genes. If anyone and she survived COVID, uh, having COVID with I just knew that you know with all the smoking that she did that coke was going to do her in but she overcame it mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing well and, and then i mean you do make a good point about you know the lifestyle because you know fred breezy said they had a large farm and he describes the farm of had you know they grew fruits and vegetables which they mm -hmm. sold at the local market they also have cattle um so Horses. they're eating fresh everything you know yeah. that's that's their diet is fruits vegetables and their own meat Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. They don't have processed food. And no. a lot, there's over 250 chemicals in the EU that are banned that we use here every day in our food. Right. Or even in Canada. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I would be, I would be shocked that most, if most, if not all of those chemicals are banned in Brazil also. Absolutely. No, they are. Absolutely. Uh, well, but, but they're also, you know, they're living in the, in the middle of the country, which is nothing but farmland and vegetation there's not much there even today but back in the 60s and 70s and 80s it was even you know obviously more rural than it is today um right. so they just they don't have the opportunity to to process foods like we yeah. do well, it's, all, it's all for with, all the, with all the hard work that they were used to uh i mean we know that people who work every single day of their life not easy jobs but really manual hard labor. I mean, they, they survive many years longer than someone who doesn't. So yeah. I say active and fit. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go another one of Steve's questions and he's, uh, we're going to skip one of them, Steve. So, uh, cause we don't have the information for that, but this one, um, and this is, we've been talking about this and we believe that, uh, well, I'll just read the question first. If the FBI uh, slash marshals knew they were in Brazil, why didn't they do anything? And I think um, I think we've talked about that quite a bit mm -hmm. as far as what uh, and we do. We know for a fact that they knew they were down there because you've provided documentation saying that they believe that they're down there. And we heard Art, the uh, former U.S. marshal, was tasked later on in the investigation saying that they worked with Interpol. And then you told me that you have proof that uh, that that they marshals were down there. Mm -hmm. So I think they they just didn't they couldn't find them. Right. I guess that's what's the the key thing. They you know they. So what do you think about that? Well, you know, so throw out the U.S. marshals for a minute. Think about the government. We talked about this with um, uh, who I think maybe it was Lenny again, uh, but. It took, it took the FBI almost over 15 years to turn it over to the U.S. Marshals. Like, why did it take so long? 
I mean, what was the reasoning why they wanted to wait? I've never heard of a case like an escape you know, prisoner from a prison that it took that long to turn it over to the U.S. Marshals. I mean, what well, was Lenny, the FBI Lenny pretty succinctly, he said the FBI can't find anything. But was <laughs> there was there a reason why they didn't want to turn it over? Is my question. Is that, yeah. you know, I've always said that if you had a secret that you wanted to keep, and you knew possibly that this individual knew something that you didn't want shared, well, keep them where you can control them. You know, as long as they're somewhere else, they're not a threat to whatever you're trying to keep. Sure. So I think it was, I think it was a benefit for them to keep them where they were at uh, and, and not pursue them. Because at some point in time, they give it to the U.S. Marshals. They don't even give them all of the documents. No, the U.S. Marshals pre- have to go back in and rebuild everything. Yeah, I think he and said, uh, Art, Art said like there was like three pages. Yeah, and by this time, they're already established in Brazil. According, according to, Brazil, uh, to Breezy, 75, they're already married. They already have children. They turned this over to the U.S. Marshals in 79, which means... Even if the U.S. Marshals had found them down there, they couldn't bring them back. So it's almost kind of like you waited all the way to this point before you ever gave me the case to begin with. Tell me to go get them. But, oh, wait a minute. They're in a place now. I can't get them. And if I find them, I can't bring them back anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> How about know, you? You, you asked me why. To me, there are so many, it's like Art told me one time, there are so many mysteries about this case. Not the escape itself, but all the things that the FBI refused to follow or that they did. And then things that they just didn't, you know, it, there's so much mystery, not just around the escape itself. Yeah. Well, it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. You know, and the only reason it's in sight right now is because you guys wrote a very compelling case for them, all the information that we've been talking about for the past 25 hours. Right. I've always, I've always said they have always known where they're at. Now, maybe not the actual location, but they've always known where they're at. And it was to their benefit to leave them. There. Makes sense. I think, I think one day when we do find them in the near future, we'll find out there. I almost, Feel like there will be other photos that we're going to discover now in their family's possession that's going to kind of back up some of the things that we're saying right now. In the program. And and, I, and actually to that point, I was going to mention this earlier and I forgot, so I just remembered. Um, I've often wondered, you know, let's say we find them definitively. You know, John's still alive. We we find a, a son and we do the DNA and it's a match. Whatever you know, whatever we find, that's absolute proof. You know, all the naysayers out there who have, who have said, no, they drowned, they didn't make it, you guys are chasing ghosts, um, how they're going to react to that? You know, what is what is going to be the response where we say, here you go, we were right all along, you were wrong, even though you were adamant in your position, what, what it's going to be like for them to say, oh, I was wrong? Well, hopefully they they probably won't make a comment. Because usually in those situations they don't. <laughs> this way, which will mean that they'll still hold on to their. Even I mean, even if we actually find, as you said, definitive proof, I think they'll probably uh, diminish it or re, you know rebut it and say, well, that's you know that's not that's not it. So and unfortunately, that's the the world we live in, where you can kind of create your own narrative right. and. Uh, and you know, and the government doesn't have to show their cards. They never have to show their cards. No. I mean, you know, so and that's why a lot of times, you know, in all kind of law enforcement investigations, and we've done a lot of them where, you know, they say their the case is an open investigation, and that immediately shuts down any kind of um invest like external investigation because they won't show and they can't show information they can't show their cards and they'll, and they'll keep cases open for years just to kind of keep people prying eyes out of it so they can control a narrative even if they don't have any progress in the case we're dealing with two cases right now 
um, that we've been investigating for a while. And, you know, they, law enforcement is not sharing information, even though we're getting information. And so it's, it's an easy, it's a two-step. It's like they, and they figure time is on their side. The longer that people don't look into it and uh, don't question it, people will just go away. And, and as we know, there's so much information in these news cycles that you can get derailed like very quickly, you know, whether it's a presidential thing, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's the Diddy thing, you have so many things to occupy people's attention that they can kind of just not talk about it and push it down, kick the can down the road. But, you know, they didn't count on you guys writing a super compelling investigative book with all the information. I mean, that's the problem, you know, and that's, and then they'll even like, you know, I mean, like you said, when you, you know, you texted uh, art and after he read the book and what he said, he goes, Oh yeah, it's a nice piece of fiction. Yeah. Nice fiction. So, <laughs> but yeah. Well, it's, it's a book based upon the FBI files. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess he's calling all the FBI files fiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much time we have? Um, I only have a couple. I have time for. Um, here's a question from from Norway. This is from. I can't. Let me see. See if you can pronounce that first name. Stian. Stian. Yes. Don't say you don't say last name. So Stian is asking, why does Ken's brother say that he's not sure anymore that the picture of the brothers taken in Brazil is the Anglin brothers? He commented this in a post on one of the Alcatraz sites a while ago. So I, I don't know if people remember uh, when I told the story about how I found the photo. Um, uh, real quick, I mean, I was I was at work. Uh, we had just got through wrapping up the pitch uh, with the company that we were going to do the show with, with History. And it was actually going to be in um, Seattle. Totally different show. And when I discovered this photo, uh, you know, the first person I showed it to was my coworker right behind me. He was freaking out and went, oh, my gosh, I, I see it, you know. And uh, I shared it with the photo team at the company I worked for. And they were like, I didn't tell them who it was or what I was doing. And they came back and because I shared two different photos, the one of John when he was younger and then that one in 1975. And they came back and said, yeah, this is the same individual. And so I you know, got my brother and uh, Michael Esslinger on the phone. Neither one of them really kind of believed me at the time, especially Michael. He didn't, he didn't see it. He, he was very skeptical. My brother, you know, he kind of was backing me. I think it was only because of his brother. But uh, so we get the uh, History Channel people on, and I show them, and they freaking out. They're like, okay, we want to do this. And so, you know, all I would say with people who question that photo, I'm an amateur. You know, and every other person who looks at that photo today, uh, like, like my brother and like other members of maybe the family or whoever else, they're amateurs, just like me. And that's the reason why I said the only way we're going to prove this photo is real is to let professionals look at it. Every single professional that they hired, uh, starting off with Michael Struge, who was the very first one in 2015, with the limited tools that he had at that time, he came back with a positive match on John and Clarence, both of them. So I thought, okay, my gosh, this is going to set the record straight. You know, everybody's going to accept this photo. Oh my gosh, throughout the next few years, people would comment to me like, well, I don't believe it's them or even like Michael Dyke, you know, he goes into measuring their hands and I'm like going, wait a minute, guys, you know, why don't we leave this to the professional people, people who do this for a living. Yeah. And so every company that came to us that specializes in looking at a photo, facial recognition, which is the same technology that we use today at airports mm -hmm. or any other place you go to sometimes they're using facial recognition to identify people. It is the way that you identify. Them. 
And then you bring in Amrose, who takes the most leading technology at the time. And he explained to us in detail how he did this. All I will say to people is that do not believe me. I'm an amateur. Don't believe anyone else. Believe the professionals. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who have said the last time it was examined, 99.7% match. That's all I can say about it. Yeah. There's always naysayers. You know, everyone, there's always going to be people, even in your own family, we have them who who will just be like, I mean, I lived abroad for seven years and there's still people in the family who don't even believe that that's true. Yes. Yes. (laughs) You well, know, so you could give yes. them all the facts and everything and there, you know, it doesn't matter. And you're right. Always leave it to the professionals because you're not a professional. We're not professionals no. in facial recognition. No, <laughs> I will never. I mean, I just, you know, I looked at it and I saw the, the resemblance. Now, my mom will tell you 100 percent after I showed it to her. She said, yes, that's my brother. She positively identified. Yeah. She yeah. Said, I know that is my brother. And so. That's all I can say. I mean, I, I can't convince anyone of anything. All I say is don't believe me, believe the professionals. <laughs> yeah. And what's interesting is that, you know, the facial recognition, because they're people, because they have different hairstyles, they have beard and stuff like that. I, you know, I have clear at the airport, you know, and, other, and I forgot that like when I took my clear first picture, I had a baseball hat on and I had my glasses on. Okay. And so it, it still recognizes me mm-hmm. completely. You know, and there's other people I've known who have had beers and shaved and it recognized them completely. So the technology works. It does. And just like Amro's uh, kind of told us about how your iPhone today works, right? You know, you could, you could hold that photo, that phone up to your face and it scans your, your, your facial, your, your facial ID, but then you can put a pair of sunglasses on and it still recognize you. Yeah. So you know, I have no doubt that this technology that they're using today took that photo, just like Amro said, they took, not only did they take a photo of, of John in the past and compared it to the photo in, in 1975, but they also took a photo of John in the age progression that all the way up until what it would have been, say, 1975, and that still made a match. <laughs> and then they took, you know, as, as he explained to us, uh, these points on your face, you can't you can't manipulate that. Uh, otherwise, how in the world are we opening our phones up today? Exactly. So. And, you know, and that's the funny part is that, you know, the government uses facial recognition for everything to, con- to find right. fugitives, to identify people for IDs and all this stuff. And then, you know, when you present this information, you said, well, there's still, you know, there's still a doubt that it could be them. You know, but if it was someone that they had an interest in um, pursuing and building a case against, and they would probably say, oh, well, yeah, well, it works. So it's all part about who's, exactly. what their motivation. So there is, unfortunately, technology doesn't take into account, uh, consideration bias. Correct. So that's where we are. Okay. Looks like we have probably time for like one more here. This one is from Patrick. And Patrick says, is there a picture of John's wife taken in Brazil? If so, why hasn't it been circulated to find out who she is and where she went? So, yes, the the photos that uh, Fred Breezy gave us uh, shows a picture of Fred standing next to a Brazilian woman uh, right next to a phone booth. And he said that this was John's wife. So we do have a photo of her. We are going to use it, hopefully in the near future, (laughs) to help uh, identify this lady. And in fact, we actually believe we have identified her uh, through other means, uh, but we we don't want to share that yet. Okay, cool. Um, So, you know, I I will say it's the, the person that we're thinking is possibly her is uh is a very good match so i'll just kind of leave it at that I, that's hopefully good. maybe we'll be able to share something in the near future yes yeah okay and then um patrick also says also the audio of fred breezy from 1992 why hasn't it been released so we can hear what was said like helen claiming she spoke to john 
after the escape. And I think it, you guys played it on the one documentary, right? Did you play some of it? Well, so the, yeah, well, some. So the, well, not on the documentary with, um, well, I don't call it, what we did with Josh Gates, a documentary. That was more of an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, the History Channel, they did play like a, oh my God, 10, 15 second clip, but this is a 45 minute uh, recording that we have. Look, actually over 45 minutes. And it's very hard to kind of hear. And the uh, U.S. Marshals during the show, they took it and ran it through this audio enhancer to kind of drown out some of the back noise. The one thing my uh, the Anglin family is very good at that's talking. <laughs> like when I'm sitting there listening to the tape, I, I'm wanting I'm trying. I'm yelling at my you know my relatives. Can y'all please be quiet so I can listen to what Fred is saying because they're they're all talking over him. And uh, it, it's really kind of hard to hear Fred sometimes. But um, I don't know. There are some things that I think we want to keep to ourselves about this recording because yeah. uh, it will aid us. It aided me and Michael, <laughs> me and Mike, uh, enable, it enabled me to find the location uh, and because of certain things that Fred said on there. Yep. And so I definitely do not want to release that. Yeah. Well, there you go. And I think we, we talked, touched a little bit about that on the podcast right. earlier. And, you know, cause obviously, you know, we love releasing audio recordings. We do it on all the time and, right. and it just kind of validates what we're doing, but it, it will be released at the appropriate time when we, right. when we get the information that we need. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, oh, here's one. It says, um, did Ken receive an FBI file that shows Robert Anglin telling Alfred that Mickey Cohen helped them with the boat and they made it? <laughs> well, so I have all of the FBI files and that particular document that they're referring to is, uh, is redacted, but mm -hmm. with the help of some individuals inside of the U.S. Marshal, I was able to get that unredacted. So, yes, we know for a fact that it is Uncle Man. It doesn't say Uncle Man. It says Man, well, which yeah. is my uncle, uh, which is the only brother that ever visited Alfred in the Atlanta Penitentiary. That can be documented. And, yes, he is the one who told Alfred that Fred Breezy, not Fred Breezy, uh, Mickey Cohen mm -hmm. uh, is the one who set up the contract for the boat. So, yes, he is that, and we do have that, and we can back that up. That's interesting. That's really good. Yeah, I and mean, we I think we talked about that. And we've talked about, you know, how in the world would my Uncle Man even know who Mickey Cohen was? <laughs> I mean, it's why ridiculous. in the world would he even say that? It's ridiculous. He wouldn't. Yeah. Would it, I mean, what did um, Uncle Man, what did he do for a living? At that point in his life, he was he was a construction worker. He drove uh, heavy equipment. Uh, he worked outside all of his life. So, you know, but another interesting thing about what Uncle Man said, and we didn't know this during the time, but when he's meeting with Fred Breezy and the and the England family, when he's there in that in that uh, meeting in '92, he makes a very interesting comment that one of the uh, his sisters asked about. Well, how could they have gotten information? outside of the prison and he makes a comment he said well all they had to do was find someone who was leaving alcatraz and they could have delivered the message out <clears throat> i'm like going oh my gosh that's exactly what happened and he just told i mean how would he even know that i mean how often did people leave alcatraz i mean it was only like it was a very small prison very few individual prisoners there it wasn't like a big prison today where everybody's coming and going every single day mm -hmm. i'm sure that you didn't have prisoners leaving every single day on No, especially from an island. No. If there, you, you were probably maybe, I'd be shocked if, if you had one prisoner leaving every year. Yeah. So to even indicate or say that someone brought information off of the island, that was Mickey Cohen. He's the only one who has ever left Alcatraz in that way. At that time period, yeah. At that time period. Well, and also to add to the story is, you know, Ken's uncle lived in Florida his whole life. 
and right. Mickey Cohen on the East Coast, and Mickey Cohen stationed out on the West Coast, out in Los Angeles. That was his base of operations. So he's three thousand miles away. How would he even have he even heard of him? Exactly. And he was a construction worker. He was a construction worker. He had no affiliation whatsoever. No whatsoever. I mean, you know, that's the, also the argument about the the brothers and how they would connect to them. I mean, these they never left that area of Florida. No. The only time they left was when they went to go meet him. Yeah. So, yeah, think about that. You know, you got these poor families. We talked about how poor this family was. They had no money. Don and Clarence, you know, supposedly if they're if they're just working as farm laborers, they're, they're making 25 cents an hour. Can you really see someone like that jumping in a car and driving all the way to Los Angeles, California, and then going up into San Francisco and then coming back with all this cash? But supposedly all they are is just farm. Yeah. Yeah. Explain to me how that. It doesn't make sense. No. And like the thing is, these are not just stories. We've put you uh, on this podcast. You've seen the photographs mm -hmm. of them heading out to California in a beat up car with you know a you know suitcases strapped to the to the back of the trunk. You know, it like the Bailey Hillbillies. <laughs> yeah, it did. It looked like the Bailey Hillbillies. You know, it's like you know t shirts and jeans. You know, and, uh, you know, and they chronicle their whole trip out there. So it's not like they document their trip to go see Mickey Cohen, like tourists. Right. I mean, it's and, just. It's and then when they come back, you look at photos and now all of a sudden they're not wearing dungarees and no. dirty clothes. They're dressed in very nice suits, patent leather shoes, driving expensive cars. As Like my mom said, they had cash. John walked in that night. She said, "What well, a roll of cash. It was, that's her words, big enough to choke a horse. You know, yeah. That was the way they said it back then. But I'm assuming it's like that, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, they're just flush with all this cash. Well, where did that come from? You tell me. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy. It's and then crazy. also to add to that, we've talked before when they got arrested, Clarence, uh, when he signed into the local motel, he signed Los Angeles as his home address and yeah. the car that he had was registered in California. So again, the California connection, well, if he's saying Los Angeles was his address, Mickey Cohen's in Los Angeles. So again, it right. connects not directly, but indirectly to Mickey Cohen. Yeah. There was and no you know, reason, no yeah. reason for them to head to Los no. Angeles. No. And I, and I told you one time I did, um, I had AI to check GPT do a, uh, like, what are the odds if an individual could take an address that and give it, you know, the exact address, the street number, the name of the address in a city that you have never visited before? You know, and it was like one in 10 million. And there was John no internet. Clarence did this. <laughs> there was no internet back then. No, they didn't no have internet. anything. No, not much forever. And he was able to write down the address that I still believe that they were headed. If they had not got arrested in, o in Ohio, one of their next stops would have been that address. The, uh, the address, in the, the one in Downey? Mm -hmm. The one in Downey. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was a house. <clears throat> so they undoubtedly had access to it. And it's still there today. Yep. It's still there today. We found the, the records and it's still there. Um, the real estate records. All right. Well, we didn't get a chance to go through all these questions, but I think we, I think it, it begs uh, another session. So maybe next week uh, okay. we can talk about more questions. And if uh, any listeners are listening now, send us more questions. This has been great because it kind of validates it from a different angle. And we like to hear what you guys have to say. And in this incredible quest to find these answers, and we will continue to update you on our investigation. I was getting um, some texts while we were on the phone regarding some information, which uh, hopefully will be fruitful. So it's, it's live and going. So until next week, guys, thanks a lot. Thank you. Great to Thank see you. you. All right.